I've been really enjoying learning how to preserve the food that I've been growing. My mom is amazing at this. And so today we got to spend the day fermenting all the vegetables that she grew in her garden. I figured that I would take you guys along with me today so you could learn how to ferment vegetables I along with me. I soaked these in ice water this morning just to kind of help keep them crisp. That was one good one. And I'm just gonna kind of give them a good rub. Make sure they're all clean. Then we're gonna actually cut the, trim the blossom end off, okay. which is the little the one. one. You can see where the stem came off. It's a little mm -hmm. bigger. It's that, we take that off because that also helps keep them crisp. Oh, why? The, blo the, the blossom end, for some reason, if you leave it on, it makes them get soft. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any bad spots, just trim them off. Um, four, four cups of water, water to two tablespoons of salt, sea salt. Eating fermented foods regularly in our diet helps our body digest by adding good bacteria to fight the bad bacteria in our gut. It also helps save all the vegetables that you've grown in your garden. Okay, so we don't want to use chlorinated water? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, because it actually stops the microbiome um, production, so it stops mm. the ferment. Next, we headed out to the garden to gather herbs like dill. Try not to step on the dill if you can, but if you do, it's not oh, a I did dill. bring you back. Okay. Just we have little sprigs like this. A little, little big chives right there too. Do you see that? Oh yeah. Oh, that's good. We're also adding grape leaves to the ferment because the tannins and the grape leaves help keep the vegetables that we're fermenting crisp and crunchy. Break up some garlic, cloves to put in. Just plop them right in. Okay. okay. It smells so good. I know. Oh. So, <clears throat> this is the first time I've done a big jar, so I just kind of. I'm not a real big measure. What is I'm this gonna star do anise? this is star anise. I'm just gonna it smells do like one licorice. of those. It does. Um, and then this is I have dark mustard seed, brown, and then I have a um, yellow mustard seed, and I like putting both in. Okay. I'm gonna do some cloves. I'm not a recipe follower. But Hundred percent, and I kind of want to do cut. So, what are the portions that you're doing? So, this is a gallon. It's a gallon. I normally do like a teaspoon of each of the mustard seed for a quart, um, and one star anise. I do like probably a teaspoon of cloves. I do a tablespoon of peppercorns and I probably put three or four cloves of garlic in for a quart um, for spices and then I'm do for this gallon or for the quart for the quart so the gallon I'm just kind of Double. I'm probably doing tripling okay um, what I put in there um, I also do a little bit of the red pepper. So I'm gonna write this down because I want to write this in the description okay the red pepper I probably do half a tablespoon in the gallon so and I'm going to do four of the bay leaves. One, two, three, four. I'll do five. Why the heck not? Just because. Yeah. <laughs> Another couple of dill heads in the top. And then I'm going to put the grape leaf over the top to kind of help hold everything down. that for keeping everything under water. 
So you can put two tablespoons of salt. It's, it's four cups of water and you wanna do two tablespoons of sea salt. I use sea salt. You can also use the Mediterranean salt or um, Celtic sea salt. Or I'm just gonna stir as we pour. Are you um, stir? Why don't you pour? stir, I'll pour. So we're going to put the little weight on there, keep that down so it's underwater, and we're going to put the lid on loosely. And then we're going to put this in a container underneath because it will, as it's fermenting, sometimes it'll overflow. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we want to make sure is the pickles or the water doesn't get below the top of the pickles. So, and I usually check it after about three or four days. Um, and then, and then if it does, I can just add more water? Yeah, salt water. Salt so water. find your ratio again, and then just add a little bit more salt water. Um, usually you don't have to, um, because the cucumbers might release a little bit, whoops, a little bit of liquid too. So mm -hmm. usually we're pretty good. And then um, once it's opened, should they be stored in the fridge? After yeah, that. once you're done with your, your ferment time, mm -hmm. you just take it and put it in the fridge and it'll last up to two years in the fridge. So. Cool. We continued this process with the rest of the vegetables. We did peppers, cucumbers, and zucchini. I'll put the recipe for all the spices and all the ratios for the water and salt in the description box below. But if I'm being honest, pretty much every jar, we did a little bit of a different take and a little bit of a different recipe on each one just to see what spices we liked best. If you don't want to have to buy all the individual ingredients for all the spices, what you can do is you can buy pickling spice, which is basically all the different spices that we use today mixed together in one canister. If you don't have any fermentation weights, what you can do is you can add a small Ziploc bag full of water on top of the vegetables to ensure that the vegetables are fully submerged by the salt water. We then screwed all the lids on very loosely and sat them in pans just in case they overflowed. We also covered them in a towel to give them a dark, dry place to ferment. All that's left to do now is to wait three days for them to ferment. Make sure that the lids are on there loosely so the pressure can be released. Take some of your eggs. 
After helping my mom, later that night I went home and started cooking dinner for a friend and I. I've been learning a lot about local farming lately and how much better it is for our bodies to have good, wholesome food that isn't genetically modified. And how now more than ever, our communities need small local farming. I've had a very sensitive stomach my whole life, so I've tried everything. Cutting out dairy, cutting out meat, cutting out sugar. And I'm really starting to think that maybe it's my body's reaction to the genetically modified chemicals more so than the actual dairy itself or the meat Hello? or the sugar. Is this Brittany? Yes, this is she. Brittany. Hi, this is, I'm not, well, the good news is yes, we do have raw milk, but no, we don't. <laughs> so okay. Um, I know, I've heard it's getting real hard to get in right now. We have, um... I've been on the hunt for raw milk in my valley. The only problem is that most places that are selling raw milk have a waiting list of about 15 people. This woman was telling me that her farm is no different. I would have to wait on the list. But we got chatting and honestly got along pretty well. She was so kind to answer all my questions about how the milking process works and how she raises her cows. I told her all about how my grandparents used to live on a dairy farm and how they would sell their milk to the local cheese factory. She knew exactly who they were. The, the way to get around that is to do the herd share. Okay. And that's where, are you familiar with them? Yeah, where I would okay. own part of a cow, correct? Yeah, so you like buy a, a portion. Twice a day or so? Twice a day, every day, 365 days a year. So my life was very, very steady. And, you know, I knew what my parents were all the time. Yeah, <laughs> so and yeah. raw milk is so much better for you than... Um, store about milk. We don't milk for the winter months. The, oh, the okay. Winter months. And then you just so, breed her again to get her milking again? Right, because she's pregnant. You know, she's getting close. Oh, okay. Which as many people as I have um, looking for raw milk. I just... I don't... Yeah, there's not a surplus right now. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, and you guys have like a milky machine that you. I hope you don't mind all my questions. I just think it's so no, interesting. I, don't mind at all. I think it's I so it's interesting. Really yeah. And I see the potential for growth. I think, wow, if we wanted to grow this, if we wanted to do the herd share, we could be milking three or four or five cows. Yeah, you really. Probably, if I haven't advertised at all this year, and still there are people looking for raw milk who come and find me like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm cooking dinner at the moment. I am making a vegetable curry, like coconut curry sort of dish with some rice, some brown rice. I put a little bit of almond butter in here, just ground almonds. And I have onion. I'm gonna put some garlic in, broccoli, carrots. What else do I put in here? and zucchini are all the ingredients so far and I put the curry, coconut, milk, salt and pepper and a little bit of um, paprika with it also. But as I was cooking dinner I called up one of the local family dairies that we have around here and I had such a good conversation with her. She was just so kind and so sweet. I've just been thinking so much about local farming and why it's kind of a dying thing, at least in the, in the valley. It seems like the idea of small farms, especially in my generation, like if you ask someone my age if they wanted to be a farmer or run a dairy or you know something like that, no one wants to do it. They just feel like it's something where you end up working 14 hour days and make pennies and it doesn't make sense. And I don't know, I just feel like that's what so many people did for all of history. Like we relied on having small farms and animals and trading with other farmers and 
sourcing within our community, that was just part of life. And I don't know why it's something that's dying now. Like people had to see it as a valuable thing. And I know it's a lot of commitment and I'm just trying to find like, it has to be worth it. Like there has to be parts of it that outweigh the commitment and the work. And so anyways, I just had a lot of questions about it and trying to understand it. And so she was so sweet. She just let me kind of talk her ear off and ask her a bunch of questions about uh, running a dairy and the positives, the negatives of it. And what she likes about it, what she doesn't like about it, and how they make it work for their family. And they have one cow and she's gonna have a little heifer in the spring. So I guess they're maybe gonna keep both cows and milk more. But it was interesting just talking to a woman that they kind of do it for fun, but they also make money. They have this huge long waiting list of people that want raw milk. And I don't know, it's just interesting to me. Like I, I definitely think that there's a market for it and there's so many people that are wanting good quality nutrition like raw milk. And I just think it's a need right now. And I like the idea of us being able to provide for ourselves and produce our own product and not have to rely on going to the grocery store I think with COVID, there was a part of me that got a little shocked for sure, but a little scared just realizing how quickly grocery store shelves can be empty. And I've never been a, this is gonna be the end of the world or conspiracy theory sort of person. I've just never cared that much about that stuff, but it was definitely an eye opener to see how quickly people can panic and wipe out grocery stores and the reality of like there could be a time when we have to go without and I want to be aware of the fragility of life and my comforts and I think especially seeing everything that's happened with the Ukraine in the last couple months it's really broken my heart and it's just been very eye-opening to see how our comforts and our conveniences are not guarantees. And even just for fun, like it, it's not just for providing for myself, but it's also the pride of working with people that are really working with their hands. They're up twice a day milking those cows and they really work for their community and I want to support that. I want to support that in my community even though it's more expensive than milk or products that I could buy at the grocery store. That's where I want to put my money. That's where I want to put my investment. So it was just so fun talking with her and I ended up knowing her because my grandparents ran a dairy. Well, my grandma grew up on a dairy and then my grandpa started working for her parents when they were in high school. So both of them have worked on a dairy and I was asking them about that. And anyways, my grandparents know her parents that ran a dairy and sold to the local cheese factory here. And so it was kind of one of those small town moments um, but it was just a really good conversation and it's been a really good thing for me to think about and maybe not everyone is interested in that and that's not why people are coming to this channel but that's something that's really been fun for me and interesting for me to think about local farming and how to do it in a way that makes sense financially nutritionally um, supporting the community and providing for our community and supporting the farmers that want to provide that service and provide that commitment and it's really a sacrifice. So that's my spiel for the day. <laughs> I'm gonna finish up dinner and oh another thing I have been putting all of my scraps in this Ziploc bag 
and putting them in the freezer. And I just put like, oh, carrots. I also put carrots in my curry. I don't know if I said that. <laughs> but um, I put all the carrot skins and the onion skins and tops of the zucchini, stuff like that inside of the Ziploc bag and I'm just gonna freeze it and eventually make bone broth because I have a bunch of meat right now and I'm gonna make some bone broth this fall at some point <laughs> once I get enough scraps and finally cook up some meat. <laughs> I also got a bunch of elk meat last night from my parents house. They're getting some salmon and halibut from a fisherman that they know up in Alaska. So we're gonna buy a box and share a box um, of salmon and halibut. And they just don't have, have enough space in their freezer and so they shared some with me. So I got to take home a couple packages of elk meat, elk steaks, and I baked them some cookies to say thank you. <laughs> it's not really an even tree, but <laughs> I baked them some cookies to say thanks. I'm also putting some bay leaves into my curry. I also put a little splash of rice vinegar in there to give it a little kick. And I'm gonna put these bay leaves in the broth along with a little bit of bone broth. And these bay leaves, I actually was helping my aunt this last spring. And she needed help clearing a bunch of land and clearing her garden and planting her garden. And so my mom and I went out to her ranch and helped clear a bunch of bushes and Play the garden and when I was clearing one of the bushes I was like oh my gosh mom what does that smell it smells like Thanksgiving or Christmas or something and she's like well it's because you're trimming a bay tree and I was like um like bay leaves so can I like take a branch home <laughs> so I literally took home a branch <laughs> and just hung it dry and Hung it in my kitchen until the leaves are totally dry. And I have, um, I think I have three of these jars worth. And oh my gosh, they make such a big difference to cook with. And it's delicious and it was free. <laughs> also, I got this dress today at a thrift store. And it was three dollars and I'm pretty stinking excited about it <laughs> the tag said 15 and then when she rang it up it said three it has like this little cute tie in the back I love it Ooh.